we begin the day with the volatile currency of American credibility. How much is it really worth? The United States is now just two weeks away from possibly defaulting on its debt. On June 1st, if the White House and Congress cannot agree to raise the federal debt ceiling, Washington will run out of money. It would be the first time in U.S. history that Uncle Sam writes checks that bounce. Democrats and Republicans have engaged in similar chicken fights over the debt ceiling before, but the option of default was never really one that anyone on either side of the political aisle took seriously. Well, apparently, the commitment to country over party is not what it used to be. U.S. President Biden and congressional leaders are still in last-minute negotiations, and those talks, they'll continue at high level while he travels to the G7 summit in Japan. Now, top of the agenda there, America to default or not. Here is what Biden told reporters today before departing on Air Force One. America's role in the world is vital, especially right now, as we work together with other countries to support Ukraine and take on the challenges demand international cooperation, and from tackling the climate crisis to uh, strengthening the, the global economy. And before I leave, I wanted to say a word about the status of negotiations with the congressional leaders. <clears throat> we had a productive meeting yesterday, and uh, with all four leaders in the Congress, it was civil and respectful. And everyone came to the meeting, I think, in good faith. I'm confident that we'll get the agreement on the budget that America will not default. Now, what I have done in anticipation that we won't get it all done till I get back is I've cut my trip short uh, in order to be for the final negotiations and sign the deal with, with uh, the majority leader. I made clear that, uh, and I'll say it again, America is not a deadbeat nation. We pay our bills. The nation has never defaulted on this debt, and it never will. America dangerously close to possibly defaulting on its debt. To talk about that, I want to pull in Clayton Allen. He is with the Eurasia Group. Clayton is a former policy advisor to the U.S. Senate. He has also worked in the financial sector. Clayton, it's good to have you with us. I mean, that is the question everyone is asking right now. So I'm going to ask you, are we about to see the United States default on its debt for the first time in its history? So the good news is I can tell you that that's very unlikely. The problem is how you actually get to an agreement to raise the debt ceiling and avoid a potential default is probably going to be pretty messy. And it probably will involve a lot of 11th hour showdowns that the markets are going to, that markets will react to negatively. So will we default? No, probably not. Will it be really painful to get a deal to avoid that default? Yes, it probably will. All right, so you're going to have jittery markets, which could possibly um, wipe out uh, you know, some people's 401ks or parts of them momentarily. Um, this will obviously dominate the talk at the upcoming G7 summit as well. Just how distracting is this homegrown debt crisis in the United States going to be at the G7, would you say? I think it'll be relatively distracting. So you've seen President Biden cancel planned meetings to Australia for a, a summit of the Quad nations, as well as a visit to Papua New Guinea, be the would have been the first U.S. sitting president to visit New Guinea. Uh, the signal that canceling both those visits sends is perhaps not that devastating functionally. Things like the U.S. and Australia's defense arrangement is going to continue, for instance. But symbolically, it shows that the U.S. is pretty well distracted by political division here at home. At the G7 summit, I would imagine that the first question Biden's going to receive from every foreign leader is, how are you handling the debt crisis? Can we trust that the U.S. is going to have stability in its government funding and the ability to deliver on the promises you've made to all of these other partner nations for around the whether it's the war in Ukraine or other areas like cooperation on clean energy? Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. If the, the G7 is looking to counter Chinese influence through the Belt and Road Project, I mean, how are they going to be able to do that if you've got a superpower, the U.S., with Republicans uh, in Congress saying, no more spending, cut it? It's a great question. And I think that the, the real question here is twofold. It's not just, do you cut spending? Is there less money available? The question is also, how willing is each political party in the US to use the policy achievements of its predecessor as a political hostage? That is, how much volatility can the world expect in US foreign policy, diplomatic policy, 
and just general approach to the rest of the world when you switch control between Republicans and Democrats, something that happens very regularly. And to be honest, given the current rate of polarization here in the U.S., seems likely to happen more frequently. There's yeah. probably going to be more frequent changes in White House control moving forward at every election rather than president serving two terms as a rule. Yeah, you know, at the beginning of the program, I, I posed the question, you know, um, how, how worthy is, is the, the currency of American credibility right now? And I mean, you, you bring up a very good point. If you've got political leaders on Capitol Hill who are willing to use this debt threat as a political pawn, that sends a very unreliable, I, I would even say a sophomoric, immature message to America's allies, doesn't it? I mean, you, we're not a reliable partner the way we used to be. Isn't that the message that's being sent? In some ways, I think it is. And I would also say it's not necessarily a new message. Remember, we had a devastating showdown over the debt ceiling in 2011. Mm -hmm. In 2015, a Republican senator sent a letter essentially saying that any tenants of the Iran nuclear deal were null and void as soon as a Republican president took office. Donald Trump delivered on that promise. And I think that those events, combined with what we're going through right now, do set an expectation that volat political volatility and control of Washington does render some U.S. commitments maybe less trustworthy than they might otherwise be viewed. And certainly the events around this particular debt ceiling showdown might impact that for quite a while. Yeah, I'm going to just ask you before we run out of time, um, another question about Ukraine. I mean, new funding for Ukraine but obviously it would need Republican um, backing in Congress. Is that under threat now when the issue comes up again? I mean, what deals will McCarthy um, be willing, willing to strike with outliers if, if he does a deal on the debt ceiling? I mean, is he going to say, OK, I'll give you, I'll save us from defaulting, but um, don't ask me for more money for weapons for Ukraine? So this is an issue that I think is, is somewhat misunderstood, actually. You have this huge push to cut domestic spending. And to be honest, there is a push from the very far right to curtail Ukraine aid. But in general, military aid to Ukraine has very strong bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. I think that that means that you do see additional aid approved this year. Just one note, we might be having that debate a lot sooner than expected because there's only about $6 billion of the $48 billion that was approved in December of last year left. If we keep sending aid at its current rate, that means U.S. aid runs out in July. So there's a, a huge need for this to become a much more immediate topic of conversation. Wow. I think ultimately, though, we do get additional aid approved that keeps U.S. assistance at a stable level through the remainder of this year. Yeah, well, if the if Congress gets through the, the debt crisis, look, from what you're saying, it's going to be a hot summer come late July. Clayton Allen with the Eurasia Group. Saint, we, we appreciate your time and your insights today. Thank you. Thank you for the time.